God of earth and altar. Dum 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 dum. I'm not good at memorizing hymns. I just like to hear them and sing them, actually. supper and uh, we had a visiting kingfisher he every morning and every evening he'd land on that tree and sit there and wait for a fish so I started looking at that kingfisher and then I started counting and I counted 37 dives before he got the first fish and I thought wow he's the king fisher you know, all these pastor things that people go to for leadership training. Uh, what do you have to do to get a congregation? Forget it. Uh, just be yourself. And not anybody else. I mean, just you. So uh, that kingfisher became kind of a icon for me as what pastors do. It doesn't work. Well, how many times have you tried? <laughs> 37? <laughs> That's in my head. When I was, oh, I guess 10, 11 years old, every Saturday I would take my bike and go to the foothills and spend the day uh, with some food frying pan and two eggs and some bacon. But I did that for years. Um, I, I was kind of a loner. The kids in the neighborhood called me a Jesus to see. Uh, so I was glad to get away from them for a few hours. <laughs> uh, I always wanted a beard, but I became a pastor just to, during the days of the, the hippies. And you know, everybody was Pretty really spooked about that, and the drugs, and the sex, and the and the beards. So I knew I couldn't I couldn't wear a beard because I was in a new congregation. Nobody knew me. I was going to be a monk. I mean, in my head. I was in my senior year in college. My girlfriend said she wanted to go to this intervarsity meeting, and this young man was leading the singing. So uh, I saw her, I spotted her in the second, second row. I just kept looking at him and thinking, I really liked his looks. I liked his smile, I liked the twinkle of his eyes when he smiled, and he smiled a lot. And I thought, mm, I'm gonna have to start going back to InterVarsity. <laughs> I said, Bob, I met a really nice girl. He said, what's her name? I said, Janice. Janice who? Oh, I didn't get her last name. You Christians, you are so stupid. How do you even manage to propagate? <laughs> Went to the cashier and said, I want a $10 worth of dimes. That was a dime for a phone call in those days. And uh, he pushed me into a phone booth and said, you start calling. Well, there were 67 stubs in Baltimore. He started at the top of the list and then down kept going, and my dad's name was Vincent. So Vincent Stubbs, it was pretty far down. And on the sixth call, um, the man said, well, she, she's next door right now. Can I ask who's calling? And suddenly, I was a monk no more. <laughs> Our wedding. Do you remember this? Sure I do. Bride, Janice Enslow Stubbs. Groom, Eugene Horland Peterson. And I was feeling silly with all this attention. Yeah, I was nervous. So were your parents, remember? Yeah. There we are, the happy couple. 
He looks too young to be getting married. In a word, what's the most important thing about pastoring? Well, relationship. If you really treat your congregation personally, relationally, you don't think of them as problems. So humility is a big part of this. But uh, it isn't humility just as a word. It's a way of living your life in relationship to others without competing. And, um, and that's why a congregation is so important. This is one place which is kind of set up to do that. Many of us grow up ambitious. And the minute the ambition becomes competitive, then it's, that's when it goes sour. I'm crown him, Lord of Your little flat. <laughs> what? <laughs> is it easy to get corrupted by culture? Oh my. <laughs> you bet it is. Instead of having an incarnation or Christ, you've got a consumer Christ who's going to give you what you want. It's the church without Christ. There's no Christ. So a consumer church is an anti-Christ church. I think a congregation is still just as important as it ever was. Uh, unfortunately, pastors, we live in an age when pastors really are more interested in how big it is, how effective it is in, in their terms. Uh, and, but this is not going to last. You know, we'll get back to something healthy and normal. And it's, there's a lot of healthy congregations going on all over the place. Uh, they just don't get in the newspapers. <laughs> did you pray with your kids growing up? Oh, yes. What did that look like? Well, we would pray at, at, at bedtime, mostly. And you realize I was doing this all alone. Because every evening, Eugene was out. <laughs> Karen let him know that it had been so many nights that he had not been home. And so that kind of shook him. Yeah. Yeah, you can be married to the church. So I think things had to change. One Sunday, she came up to her dad before church and she said, Daddy, I don't want to go to church today. And he put his arm around her and he says, Oh, Karen, I feel that way sometimes too. <laughs> My son Eric said, you know who my favorite person in the Bible is? Uh, I said, no. He said, Jeremiah. And here's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and nobody likes him. He's, you know, he's a failure. <laughs> and I said, why Jeremiah? And Eric said, because he was also the son of a priest. <sighs> when he said that, it just melted me. And I thought, I'm going to write a book about Jeremiah. What I missed most after I was no longer a pastor is the intimacy. The kind of intimacy that I was experiencing seemed to me to be unique to pastoral life. But I didn't notice until I left. And then I thought, oh, that's, that's why I like being a pastor. How long did it take you to write the message? In round figures, um, about 20 years. But you know, I wasn't keeping track of things. It was just a kind of a seamless process. I spent, I would say, a good five years learning the language of my congregation. And that's what came out. I just, I, I really didn't, I didn't think I was doing something that extraordinary but I knew I was doing something for my congregation that was extraordinary. They were, they were listening to this for the first time. How many books have you written? 35, not including the message. Why do you not include the message? Because it's not my book, <laughs> really. 
It's just, I don't think of it as, it's not my book. I always felt that I was more than a pastor's wife. I'm trying to write my story right now. And it's slow going because I'm not getting any <clears throat> help from anybody close by me. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think beauty is almost inherent in reality. I think we're taking the stuff that God has created and letting it shape our lives, and that becomes art. That's the beauty. This quotation from Isaiah 53, 2. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. A whiff, a beagle for beauty, I sniffed Monet's haystacks, Van Gogh's sunflowers, devoutly meditated Marilyn's breasts, watched kingfishers, lost the scent. Art is making visible what's invisible in the life of faith. And that's the most important thing about faith. It's between you and me and God, but you can't see it. But you can see when, when it's not there, there's no relationship or there's criticism or there's anger or something. And I just think that word between is just a really powerful concept to understand the nature of what we're at all this time. Did you like doing communion? I did, yeah. Which part did you like best? I just like the whole Eucharistic symbolism. It keeps us in touch with the Incarnation. It's not just ideas, it's getting in, into your gut, yeah. The minute we try to spiritualize Jesus, um, we, we become, the fancy word for it is Gnostics. We just get, it's an idea, uh, just a truth. Uh, but there's no flesh to it. You're the flesh, I'm the flesh, Jesus is the flesh. What would be the characteristics of a saint? Humility, number one. Unpretentiousness, having no idea that they're a saint. <laughs> Define authenticity. Being content to be yourself, not be somebody else. There's been nobody like you from the foundation of the world like Greg. <laughs> Face it, <laughs> you're stuck with yourself. Now learn about yourself. That's what we're doing. And uh, the church, when it, the church at its best lets us be ourselves, encourages us to be ourselves. Kiss the leper's wound, taste honey. Touch the blind eye, learn braille. Keep vigil at the cradle, change diapers, drink tears from the chalice, live Eucharist. Where is your new adventure taking you next? I'm getting old. I've never felt old before. Does death concern you? Not really. Jan and I talk about it sometimes. We sit out here and talk about it sometimes. I don't think so, yeah. What are you looking forward to in the future? Kevin. We're gonna hold hands and walk into heaven together. That's what we'd like. I don't think I have any regrets. I, would, I wouldn't know what else to do. I'm just grateful. Like, grateful is the, is the word I think I would use. That I've, uh, I've been able to live my life feeling like Eugene, not somebody else. Yeah.
What would you like your legacy or your echo on humanity to be? This might sound unrealistic, but it's, it's my hope. I hope I could be part of changing the pastoral imagination of American pastors. Happened on found things, found in gutters, found on a cross, found under a stone, heard in the rustling grass, heard in a tongue stammering sabachthani, found when I wasn't looking, heard when I wasn't listening, found beauty. I treasure the way other people love her, accept her, celebrate her, yeah. I treasure his spirituality, the depths of him. Um, I don't treasure that the boy doesn't talk much. <laughs> I wish he talked a little more. What's been the best bits of living for you? Uh, my marriage and my children. Yeah. I could, all the rest could go to pot and I think I'd still make it. <laughs> yeah, my marriage and my children. Thank you for sharing your life with us. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for listening, <laughs> affirming it. <laughs> What are we doing? So that's the question in life, isn't it? <laughs> Do you want to say action? Action. There you go. <laughs>